All such conventions are equally legitimate, though not all are equally convenient. Old-fashioned physics used the notion of force, which seemed intelligible because it was associated with familiar sensations. When we are walking, we have sensations connected with our muscles, which we do not have when we are sitting still. Everybody knew from experience what it is to push or pull, or to be pushed or pulled. These very familiar facts made force seem a natural basis for dynamics. But the Newtonian law of gravitation introduced a difficulty. The force between two billiard balls appeared intelligible because we know what it feels like to bump into another person. But the force between the Earth and the Sun, 93 million miles apart, was mysterious. Even Newton regarded this action at a distance as impossible, and believed that there was some hitherto undiscovered mechanism by which the Sun's influence was transmitted to the planets. However, no such mechanism was discovered, and gravitation remained a puzzle. As physics has advanced, it has appeared more and more that sight is less misleading than touch as a source of fundamental notions about matter. The apparent simplicity in the collision of billiard balls is quite illusory. As a matter of fact, the two billiard balls never touch at all. What really happens is inconceivably complicated, but is more analogous to what happens when a comet enters the solar system and goes away again than to what common sense supposes to happen. Most of what we have said hitherto was already recognized by physicists before the theory of relativity was invented. It was generally held that motion is a merely relative phenomenon. That is to say, when two bodies are changing their relative position, we cannot say that one is moving while the other is at rest, since the occurrence is merely a change in their relation to each other. But a great labor was required in order to bring the actual procedure of physics into harmony with these new convictions. The technical methods of the old physics embodied the ideas of gravitational force and of absolute space and time. A new technique was needed, free from the old assumptions. For this to be possible, the old ideas of space and time had to be changed fundamentally. This is what makes both the difficulty and the interest of the theory of relativity. A certain type of superior person is fond of asserting that everything is relative. This is, of course, nonsense, because if everything were relative, there would be nothing for it to be relative to. However, without falling into metaphysical absurdities, it is possible to maintain that everything in the physical world is relative to an observer. This view, true or not, is not that adopted by the theory of relativity. Perhaps the name is unfortunate. Certainly it has led both philosophers and uneducated people into confusions. They imagine that the new theory proves everything in the physical world to be relative, whereas, on the contrary, it is wholly concerned with excluding what is relative and arriving at a statement of physical laws that shall in no way depend upon the circumstances of the observer. It is true that these circumstances have been found to have more effect upon what appears to the observer than they were formerly thought to have, but at the same time, the theory of relativity shows how to discount this effect. That is the source of almost everything that is surprising in the theory. When two observers perceive what is regarded as one occurrence, there are certain similarities, and also certain differences between their perceptions. The differences are obscured by the requirements of daily life, because from a practical point of view, they are, as a rule, unimportant. But both psychology and physics, from their different angles, are compelled to emphasize the respect in which one person's perception of a given occurrence differs from another's. Some of these differences are due to differences in the brains or minds of the observers, some to differences in their sense organs, some to differences of physical situation. These three kinds may be called, respectively, psychological, physiological, and physical. 
a remark made in a language we know will be heard, whereas an equally loud remark in an unknown language may pass entirely unnoticed. Of two travellers in the Alps, one will perceive the beauty of the scenery, while the other will notice the waterfalls with a view to obtaining power from them. Such differences are psychological. The differences between a long-sighted and a short-sighted person, or between a deaf person and someone who hears well, are physiological. Neither of these kinds concerns us. The kind that does concern us is the purely physical kind. Physical differences between two observers will be preserved when the observers are replaced by cameras or recording machines and can be reproduced. If two people both listen to a third person speaking, and one of them is nearer to the speaker than the other, the nearer one will hear louder and slightly earlier sounds than are heard by the other. If two people both watch a tree falling, they see it from different angles. Both these differences will be shown equally by recording instruments. They are in no way due to idiosyncrasies in the observers, but a part of the ordinary course of physical nature as we experience it. Physicists, like ordinary people, believe that their perceptions give them knowledge about what is really occurring in the physical world, and not only about their private experiences. Professionally, they regard the physical world as real, not merely as something which human beings dream. An eclipse of the sun, for instance, can be observed by any person who is suitably situated, and is also observed by the photographic plates that are exposed for the purpose. Some people imagine that relativity made a difference in this respect. It has made none. But if the physicist is justified in this belief that a number of people can observe the same physical occurrence, then clearly the physicist must be concerned with those features which the occurrence has in common for all the observers, for the others cannot be regarded as belonging to the occurrence itself. Such things as differences of perspective, or differences of apparent size, due to difference of distance, are obviously not attributable to the object. They belong solely to the point of view of the spectator. Common sense eliminates these in judging of objects. Physics has to carry the same process much further, but the principle is the same. We are not concerned with anything that can be called inaccuracy, but with genuine physical differences between occurrences, each of which is a correct record of a certain event from its own point of view. When a gun is fired, people who are not quite close to it see the flash before they hear the report. This is not due to any defect in their senses, but to the fact that sound travels more slowly than light. Light travels so fast that from the point of view of most phenomena on the surface of the earth, it may be regarded as instantaneous. Anything that we can see on the earth happens practically at the moment when we see it. In a second, light travels 300,000 kilometers, about 186,000 miles. It travels from the sun to the earth in about eight minutes, and from the stars in anything from four years to several thousand million. Of course, we cannot place a clock on the sun send out a flash of light from it at 12 noon Greenwich Mean Time and have it received at Greenwich at 12.08 p.m. Our methods of estimating the speed of light are those we apply to sound when we use an echo. We can send a flash to a mirror and observe how long it takes for the reflection to reach us. This gives the time for the double journey to the mirror and back. If the distance to the mirror is measured, then the speed of light can be calculated.